I am not Markus Witter, although I would like to be. Thank you. And so I'm going to talk about <coughs> Markus Hutter's asymptotically fastest solver of all well-defined problems. I think every computer scientist should know about that, and especially in uh, recurrent network research, where you are really dealing with search in program space, you should know that there is something which is optimal in a certain sense in doing that, which has very little to do with uh, what is traditionally done in neural network research. So I'm saying, I'm going to say a few things about that. This is my, my real name and how to pronounce it. And to, um, to, to um, drive home the point, we have these very um, sexy and very interesting recurrent neural networks, which are basically parallel sequential uh, computers. And the program of these recurrent networks obviously is the weight matrix. And we know that they can compute anything that uh, this laptop can compute if you um, insert the proper weight matrix. And we can even learn to do that. And the popular thing in the neural network community is that you compute at least in supervised learning, a gradient with respect to the error which uh, expresses the difference between what the network does and what it should have done. And then you feed in sequences, video, speech, and you uh, get sequences out, and there's a difference between what you wanted to get out and what you really got out, and that you can uh, translate into weight changes. And basically, the sexy cool thing is that you have um, a pointer in the space of programs, a direction in the space of algorithms, which points to a better program. That's um, very interesting. That was uh, my, the trigger, of, um, that triggered my, my main fascination with these uh, parallel sequential computers many, many decades ago. But these things are, of course, not theoretically optimal in any sense. They are local search-based, and you have local minima and all kinds of issues, and nobody can guarantee that you're going to solve your problem within so many iterations and so on. And there is a, a quite different approach to optimal program search in theoretical computer science. And it goes back at least to Leonid Levin, who in 1973 proposed a universal search. And how many people know what is universal search? Mm -hmm. How many people do not know what is universal search? Okay. Again, we have a third group <laughs> who did not understand the question. The basic idea is you have a problem, you don't have a teacher who tells you how to solve it. Now you have to find a program that computes a solution to this problem and you have to verify that the solution is correct. The process of verification will also cost you something. So there's a cost in verification. Some people, some, some problems are easy to verify. Uh, for example, you can easily verify whether your chess game that you just played, whether you won or not. And um, some, people, some problems are much harder to verify. For example, suppose you have a traveling salesman problem, and then you want to find the shortest path through all these cities. Now you have a pretty short path, but you have to show that it's really the shortest. And, um, and the only way um, that, that seems to make sense at first glance, uh, first glance is you go through all these possible uh, paths and show really that this one is the shortest. Now, um, the optimal, asymptotically optimal way of solving problems like that is you search systematically in program space. And there are so many programs. Now, you do it with a huge favor you, you greatly favor those uh, programs that are short and fast. And that's what Levin uh, did in 1973. Basically, he allocated runtime to all these different programs that you can have on a universal computer. And the fraction of the total search time that was spent on a particular program is proportional to the probability of that program if you are looking at <clears throat> programs in, in, uh, 
encode it as bit strings, then if you have a program of size 10, the probability of randomly guessing it is 2 to the minus 10. And so this program is going to get 2 to the minus 10 of the total search time. And not only the program itself, but also the procedure that is used to verify whether the solution computed by this program is um, correct. Now, um, it turns out that this very simple approach is asymptotically optimal in the sense that it's going to solve any problem with a computable uh, solution as quickly as the fastest unknown program that computes that solution and verifies it. Save for a constant factor, which is the probability of the program essentially. But nevertheless, as the program, um, as the problem gets larger and larger, this constant factor doesn't change. And that's the reason why this thing is asymptotically optimal. Now, this is a type of optimality which is not as pleasing as the one that Marcus achieved. Marcus Hutter went beyond this. So here we see, down there, uh, we see that the complexity of solving a certain problem of size n, suppose that is O n to, thir or to the third, well then this universal Levin search is going to solve the same problem also in O to n to the third steps. However, this multiplicative constant may be li rather large. If it's 10 to 100, then um, not everybody is going to use it. Now, Marcus, what Marcus did, he brought that down to an additive constant. Now there's an, an optimal way of solving arbitrary computational problems, which is as efficient as the fastest way of solving that type of problem save for an additive constant, which completely disappears as the problems get larger and larger. So if you have a, um, a problem of size n, and maybe there is a proof that you can solve it within n to the third operations, then this meta-algorithm of Markus Hutter is going to spend only n to the third operations on finding the solutions plus O of 1 plus O of 1 on something else. But this O of 1, as n gets larger, pales and, um, and can be neglected. Many people in machine learning, and especially in neural network research, don't even know that there is such an optimal, theoretically optimal method for solving all kinds of computational problems. So you should know that. That's why I'm trying to explain briefly what's going on. How many more minutes do I have? Um, mm. Okay, thanks. I'm in the last hour of my presentation, I'm learning. So, so now, what is happening there? I have only one slide on this. This is the only slide that I have. Essentially, what Marcus is doing, he is looking at all kinds of proofs. There's a proof generator in this um, meta program, and it comes up uh, with uh, sequences of proofs, and the last theorem in the proof, uh, which is uh, derived from a certain set of axioms, says something about time bounds. And it says, essentially it says, okay, we have a current problem, uh, some, some, um, some problem that we want to solve, and we encode that in form of a function. We want to find um, mapping from x to y, and for all x element, capital X, we are uh, trying to find a program that will solve this, this say, traveling salesman problem or something. Now, what the meta learner, the meta program does, it goes through all these proofs, sequentially um, uh, generates proofs, until it found a proof that uh, a program Q, a particular program Q, provably computes the function that you want to compute for all the um, elements of the domain, for all the elements Z of the domain X within a certain time bound which depends on the program Q and on the instance Z. And then as new time bounds are coming in by the theorem prover all the time new time bounds are coming in, you spend most of the time on the program Q with the best currently proven time bound. And there is a clever way, which I'm not, um, 
explaining in detail here, which deals with the possibility that new time bounds might come in very quickly, and so new programs queue might come um, uh, up as uh, the most likely candidates of solving this problem. So that's a good way of dealing with that problem. And um, it turns out that there's a proof that this procedure is going to solve your current instance, your current problem instance, your current Z, um, as quickly as, the fi as if you knew the optimal program for the solution in advance. That's incredible. So there's a meta algorithm which is as good as the best unknown algorithm for solving that problem, save for an additive constant. The additive constant, of course, hides the proof search. Now the proof search costs you something. It's not so easy to search among all these proofs. However, it's, it's finite. So once you have a proof for a certain class of functions for traveling salesman problems or whatever, and suppose it turns out that traveling salesman problems of size n can be solved within n to the 17 steps on average, then this thing is going to solve it within n to the 17 steps plus this additive constants, which completely can be neglected as the n gets larger and larger. So, if you, if you want to understand every little detail, it's about one page or something like that, you have to study Marcus's original paper uh, from, 1992, from 2002 when he was in my lab, uh, but at least you know now there is something like an asymptotically optimal fastest way of solving all kinds of computational problems. Now, some people say, yeah, okay, but uh, the uh, problems in, in this universe, they are so small, on this planet are so small, that the constant overhead for the proof search still plays a big role in most practical applications. And these people are right. And that's the only reason why we are still in business, in deep learning, why we are not all using this thing here. Uh, because our problems are so small, our average problems are so small and simple that we we don't want to use this optimal way of doing them. Hmm. Now, some people um, tell me that it is useless to use these uh, universal methods for practical problem solving, but that's not true. Let's just take uh, Levin's um, method, which is asymptotically optimal in a way that is not quite as powerful as Marcus's method, but we can use that um, for transfer learning, algorithmic transfer learning, as we are trying to solve first a simple problem, then another problem, not quite as simple, and another problem, and another problem. So transfer learning from one problem to the next. And this always has been a big issue in computer science and machine learning. And um, people like Olson uh, in 1994 had cool systems, genetic algorithms, uh, which uh, reused previously found programs and so on. But there's an optimal way of reusing these previously found programs and doing uh, asymptotically optimal transfer learning in a way that really makes sense and can be applied in practice. That's what I did in 2004 with the optimal order problem solver, which is just an extension of Levin search to this incremental case, where, which is sometimes called the curriculum case, curriculum training. You first have one problem and you, you get a solution and then you reuse the solution somehow to come up with a better solution or more quickly for the next problem and so on and so on. And, uh, and that's of course what you can do with search in program space. And what I did back then was just have a long sequence of tasks and now at when you ha already have solved 100 tasks, now you want to solve the 100 first task. And how do you do that? Well, um, you, you search again among the space of programs, in the space of programs for this um, program which will solve the new task, and you spend half of the time on learning everything from scratch and half of the time on trying to write programs that address previously um, found programs and parts of them and put them into a storage and edit a few bits there and then run them, point the instruction pointer there and run them. And 
in many, many cases, it is possible to greatly, greatly profit from this, you might call it a meta-learning approach, where um, you can exploit the previous um, algorithmic knowledge found in the previous solutions, and we showed that we could increase uh, problem solving for Hanoi, for example, by a factor of 1,000, by first teaching the system something about recursion, and then it quickly learns a double recursive program that does the uh, Tower of Hanoi problem for 30 disks, and maybe some of you know that for 30 disks you need, even if you do the optimal solution, you need two to the 30, so a billion steps of operation, a, a billion moves, and, um, and of course it found that, it found that, and in the end, 5% of the total search time was spent just on this final um, execution of the program that it found, which ran for a million, billion steps and solved the Tower of Hanoi problem for 30 disks. So we have lots of examples where this algorithmic transfer learning really profits from these optimal universal methods. And it has been done in 2004 or something like that. Now the same principles can be applied to recurrent networks. And now I'm going to finish my little um, uh, reminder of um, algorithmic op of uh, optimal algorithmic methods. And if uh, there's a question, I'll be happy to answer it. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Jürgen. Is there a question? Did everybody understand everything? I said I everything. Question. I can understand that there's no extra question. Um, so you talked about, you know, there exist these asymptotically optimal things, and maybe they're actually, over here, uh, to your right. And maybe they're actually useful for some real problems. What I'm wondering is, like, um, can we sort of add something more like deep learning to this and generalize in a, in a smart way using function approximators? So like for instance, in this Tower of Hanoi problem, do you think that uh, the solution you found, does it already generalize to any size of tower or would it easily mm -hmm. do that? Yeah. Or would you sort of need to learn 31 and then yeah. 32 and then? Yeah. No, actually it does exactly that. So um, I remember the first, for, for one disk, it took a long day, it took a millisecond or something to find a solution. It didn't generalize. And for two disks, it found a really stupid program that kind of exploited um, weird things in the, in the programming language to, to solve that thing. And then the third one, was really elegant, and the third one actually um, looked back at a previously found program that was used to um, to learn to to solve uh, context-free languages, and um, greatly increased the probabilities of instructions that you can use to build uh, recursion. And then it used this augmented, this boosted thing to greatly increase the probability of finding a, a double recursive program, which you need for solving the towers of Hanoi, and that's what it found. And then this thing uh, generalized to all n. So it was a perfect generalization there, and if I had kept running it, not only for n is to n is 30, but n is 40, then uh, we would have had another factor of 1,000 just for the runtime for the final program, which was the generalizer. And, um, and in that case, only 5% of the total time um, would have gone for the search itself, for finding this good program, and the rest just for executing the perfect um, uh, program. So it's doing exactly what you want. Without any deep learning. There's another question. Uh, uh, if the answer is short, we have another question. Yeah, I'll try to keep it short. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this work. Um, my question was, so now we, you've shared this alternative and theoretically asymptotically optimal way of doing program search. We have our parametric sort of deep learning program search. Um, given that you understand this work considerably better, could you share some of your intuitions about how we should be seeing this kind of theoretical work informing uh, kind of the, the, the line of progress mm -hmm. in the parametric world? Mm -hmm. uh, two answers. One is you can take any uh, of your favorite deep learning algorithms as a primitive for something like that. So it's just a subprogram that can be called by the more general uh, program search method, which, which I just explained, which is based on primitives. Anything can be a primitive. So that's one thing. Generally speaking, um, although I love these um, these ways of thinking about differentiable program space and uh, gradient-based uh, search in the space of algorithms, I think and there are many many. Uh, 
programs which are better solved by discrete search, especially as you're trying to compactify everything such that a change of a one little bit changes the, in, uh, the behavior of the program totally. So this is what you get in cool methods for program search, and that's why I'm kind of pessimistic that the best program searches of the future will be gradient-based. Thank you. Let's thank uh, Jürgen again.